We have a big, uh, this is CDR today, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome. i um, very pleased to see so many of you uh, here with us, and I you know, see more people rolling in. I um, want to welcome you to uh, This is CDR. Um, Open Air is excited to present This is CDR, an online event series to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals we have under development for New York and other states and localities. Um, Many of you already have, but if you haven't, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. It's always nice to see the, the global audience of uh, this is CDR. Um, just some quick background on open air. If you're not familiar with us, we're a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of CDR solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Our growing global community collaborates on shared open source missions in the areas of policy advocacy, research and development, and CDR activist market development. Um, we'll be putting a link in the chat to <clears throat> excuse me, our join page, and we'd love to see you uh, on our Discord platform, which is how we communicate. Um, we have lots of great projects going on, and we'd love to get everyone uh, involved. Before we get started with today's program, um, just some quick background uh, on carbon removal. Uh, many of you are already familiar, of course, but first of all, it's important to define what CDR is. Um, CDR is a human activity that removes CO2 from the atmosphere and durably stores it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. Really two important things to, uh, to, to say up front whenever we're talking about CDR. Number one, um, CDR is not in any way, shape, or form an alternative to reducing emissions. Uh, we must reduce global emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, um, every credible climate forecast, there's very clear consensus, uh, including in really very stark terms uh, yesterday's uh, IPCC AR6 Working Group 3 report that CDR will be necessary at gigaton scale, that's billions of tons per year by mid-century. Um, the whole industry of durable CDR is currently at kiloton scale, estimated 50,000 tons in 2021, so we have a long way to go. It's really critical and incumbent on, on all of us to get started working on it now so we can scale to the level that we need by mid-century. Um, the other really important thing to talk about when we talk about carbon removal is to disambiguate it from what is called carbon capture, which is the capture of CO2 from a emission source, whether it's a cement factory or a natural gas power plant. This is often conflated in news reports, and it's really kind of dangerous, I think, because carbon capture is a form of emissions reduction, whereas carbon removal is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So really important to make sure that we're talking about carbon removal and not conflating it with other things. Um, there are lots of great resources online to learn about carbon removal. Um, first of all, this series, we're now episode 29, and uh, all of those recordings are available online. Great place to start. The logo there for the carbon dioxide removal primer, it's kind of an open source textbook peer reviewed by over 50 um, really uh, leading CDR academic researchers. Um, that is a great resource as well. And uh, we'll be putting a few other um, links in the chat that you can, you can check out to learn more. Very quick background on the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act, which is one of our primary uh, open air's primary policy proposal initiatives that we're working on right now. It's a state level carbon removal procurement policy to get the public sector to start providing durable market, sorry, market support for durable CDR, um, which is what we're going to need to get from our current kiloton scale to gigaton scale by mid-century. Um, the CDRLA is standards based pathway agnostic, centered on equity, community benefit, and environmental justice. Um, it's really a, a very important industrial development policy for a state like New York um, and job creation. Um, additionally, we're working on to advance the policy in other states, a half dozen at least other states listed here. And so um, the, some links in the chat to learn more. And we again, we'd love to have you join Open Air to help us advance this and other policies that we're working on. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague and special guest co-host, Val Winters, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Toby. Uh, I'm Dahl Winters. I am an Open Air member since 2020, uh, CTO of Deep Science Limited. I do a uh, work of, um, in various areas with regard to carbon removal, primarily with regard to carbon mineralization, uh, using calcium hydroxide as well as uh, solid sorbents. So I'm really glad to be here today. Um, this week on CDR, uh, this is CDR, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Kelman of Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory to tell us about his extensive research for the main event today into mineralization pathways for CDR. Dr. Kelman studies the chemical and physical processes of reaction between fluid and rocks. He has worked on the genesis and evolution of oceanic and continental crust 
chemical cycles and subduction zones, and new mechanisms for earthquake initiation. His primary focus now is on the geologic capture and storage of CO2 and reaction-driven cracking processes in natural and engineered settings with application to CCS, the global carbon cycle on Earth and Mars, geothermal power generation, hydrocarbon extraction, and in situ mining. He teaches a popular course on Earth resources for sustainable development and a new course on carbon storage at Columbia, as well as courses and seminars on petrology, geochemistry, and geodynamics. Dr. Kelman was a founding partner of Dihedral Exploration from 1980 to 1992, uh, consultant specializing in exploration for min mineral deposits and steep terrain with contracts in Canada, Alaska, and Greenland. Research and climbing have taken him to some awesome places, Peru, India, Oman, the Aleutian Islands, 7,500 meters above sea level in Pakistan, and 5,500 meters below sea level via submersibles along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Dr. Kellerman received his AB from Dartmouth College in 1980 and his PhD from the University of Washington in 1987. He then spent 16 years at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution before moving to Columbia's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in 2004. And lastly, Dr. Kellerman was recently awarded the American Geophysical Union Hess Medal. He is a, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and as a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the Mineralogical Society of America, and the Geochemical Society. So I'm really, really pleased to uh, have Dr. Kellerman here today to share his knowledge and expertise with us. And uh, Dr. Kellerman, please take it away. Thank you very much, Dal. Uh, and thank you, Toby, for coaching me. And thank you all for the invitation to join you today. Um, as Dal and Toby know, I wasn't quite sure what to talk about today. So I had to pick kind of a subset uh, of uh, different things. And actually I, I prepared a big long PowerPoint, it's way too long. And then I was giving a, a lecture today in class on a similar topic and I decided to a certain extent, I'll just give you the lecture I gave to Columbia's engineering students today. Um, Dal and Toby both told me that this is a group that likes to have quantitative and technical information. And so that dictated kind of how I chose this subset, but there's a lot more if you want to have me back or write me email or whatever else, um, I'd be glad to share some more ideas. <clears throat> So as many of you, but maybe not all of you know, uh, the Earth's mantle is composed of, uh, most upper mantle is composed of magnesium silicate minerals, mostly the mineral olivine. And the gemstone name for olivine is peridot. So the rock type that's of rich in olivine is known as peridotite. And the Earth's upper mantle uh, down to about 410 kilometers depth is composed dominantly of olivine. Olivine is very far from equilibrium with the atmosphere and surface waters. And so normally it's shielded from reaction with the surface by uh, the crust of the earth. But locally, plate tectonics uh, does us the favor of moving those rocks toward the surface where they're exposed by faulting and erosion. And when that happens, this disequilibrium creates kind of an enormous battery um, a giant reservoir of chemical potential energy that drives uh, natural hydration, oxidation, and carbonation reactions. And we'll be, of course, focusing on the carbonation reactions today. But the primary motivator here um, has been to take this uh, reservoir of chemical potential energy that's free and try and figure out ways to emulate spontaneous natural processes in order to design engineered systems that are accelerated, but, but reduce cost by using these natural sources of potential energy. So probably most of you know, carbon mineralization involves taking magnesium or calcium bearing minerals and reacting them with CO2 from air or surface waters to make carbonate minerals. And of course you can do that to remove CO2 from air, which I guess is this group's primary focus or you can do that uh, using fluids that are already enriched in CO2 for storage. So some examples, uh, the magnesium end member olivine here 
known as forsteride, combines with two moles of carbon dioxide to make two moles of magnesium carbonate and one mole of quartz. These are inert, non-toxic minerals. You can eat them, it won't do you any good, but it won't do you any harm. And above 75 degrees C or so, uh, this carbonation reaction is quite fast. Um, products of hydrous alteration of olivine include serpentine, so that's this uh, hydrous magnesium silicate here, combines with CO2 to form magnesium carbonate and again quartz. Um, but that's quite a bit slower. And then brucite, magnesium hydroxide, combines with CO2 to make magnesium carbonate. That's also quite fast. In order to understand um, some of what I'm going to show you, you need to add calcium to this simple picture. So in peridotite, a lot of the calcium is in these calcium pyroxene minerals, and those react to form serpentine plus dissolved calcium. And then that dissolved calcium kind of hangs around and comes back to the surface. So I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. OK, so um, I was aware of what these systems were uh, since I was a grad student, but I didn't really care about them until I moved to Columbia University in 2004 and heard people like Wally Broker and Klaus Lochner talking about carbon mineralization for CO2 storage or even removal from air. And um, so I, I went back to places where I've been working and with a new eye. So one thing that's very evident in some of these places are travertine deposits. So here you see on the left here, you see these white uh, travertines. They're composed entirely of calcium carbonate in the background. These are mountains uh, of mantle peridotite that's been exposed by erosion. And this is a peridotite hosted uh, catchment, which has, is giving, is uh, spewing out this pH 12 water that has basically no carbon in it and no magnesium in it, but it's very rich in calcium hydroxide. And it, it reacts directly with CO2 from air to form this calcite here. You can see this little film on this, on this pool here that film is composed entirely of calcium carbonate. Also in the same kind of rocks from the Earth's mantle, when they weather and react with surface waters, they form these white carbonate veins in variably hydrated uh, peridotites. So, uh, and when I first uh, started working on these things, I thought in Oman, the Sultanate of Oman, where I was working, I thought a lot of these carbonate veins were 100 million years old, but as I'll show you, I was wrong. And in fact, I should have, I should have known better. And then the same process happens where uh, peridotite is exposed on the seafloor. So this is a place known as Lost City. And there is calcium, the same kind of thing, pH 11, calcium hydroxide rich seawater coming, or water coming out of the seafloor. It's buoyant with respect to seawater, so it rises and makes these tall chimneys instead of flat travertine deposits, but otherwise it's very similar. And uh, as I'll show you later, because uh, the water that's coming out at Lost City doesn't have any magnesium or carbon in it, we know that there are subsurface vein systems where magnesium carbonates have deposited. Okay, so um, again, I moved to Columbia and I got interested in this process. And so the first few seasons, we would basically just leap out of the truck uh, and pick up carbonates wherever we saw them. And we sent them to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution where we use the carbon 14 method to, to date them. And there's reasons why I have age in, in, uh, in quotation marks down here, but um, Unless somebody wants me to ask um, to ask me about that at the end, let's just leave that as age. So the travertines, no surprise, uh, are zero age in many cases where we see them forming today. They have a modern carbon-14 content, and uh, then they span uh, a few tens of thousands of years in age. But the surprise for me was that those veins that form in the subsurface have a similar range in ages. They're a little bit older, which stands to reason because they form in the subsurface and it takes some time for them to uh, be uplifted to the surface and exposed by erosion. But basically they have an average age of about 25, 26,000 years, 
which, you know, I thought they were 100 million years old. So this is a surprise to me. You could ask, how come we're never sampling older ones? There must have been older ones. And um, we can find now outcrops where they're dead, uh, have no carbon-14 in them at all. But nonetheless, uh, why are so many seems to be young? And, and we understand this as kind of a, a, a residence time. So these veins are mostly forming in a weathering horizon, maybe 20 meters thick. And um, they, they're then uplifted and eroded uh, and exposed at the surface and then ultimately eroded and go out to sea. And so the sort of residence time for those things is maybe about 26,000 years on average. So the peridotite uh, is exposed to the air. Rain falls on the peridotite. Rain, as many of you will know, uh, has a slightly acid pH. And the dominant dissolved carbon species in rain is carbonic acid or neutral dissolved CO2. And so that acidic fluid reacts with the rocks, dissolves the magnesium silicates. And that process takes CO2 directly from air. So the uh, weathering by the rain uh, forms lots of dissolved magnesium and lots of dissolved bicarbonate ion here and then neutral dissolved silica. Okay, and at the same time, any brucite that's around is dissolving to form, again, uh, dissolved magnesium in solution plus uh, hydroxyl. So this process serves to increase the magnesium concentration in the water, increases the carbon concentration, and uh, increases the pH. Okay, so you'll just have to take my word for it that bicarbonate and magnesium are very strongly correlated in these systems so we can show them on the same plot. So rainwater and seawater have this enrichment in carbon and magne dissolved magnesium and an increase in pH where they react with peridotite on the surface. Some of those fluids then go deeper into the subsurface where they can no longer take CO2 out of the air. And there they begin to saturate and precipitate um, hydrated magnesium silicates like serpentine and magnesium carbonate minerals. So they are still dissolving olivine and they're dissolving this calcium and magnesium, uh, calcium magnesium pyroxenes. So there's increasing magnesium in solution uh, initially, increasing calcium in the solution. There's no place to put it. And ultimately the magnesium concentration gets high enough that the uh, fluids saturate in serpentine here, magnesium silicate and magnesium carbonate here, magnesite. So the pH continues to go up but solid magnesium silicates and carbonates start to precipitate. And that drives the magnesium and carbon concentration in those fluids down, down, down. But there's no place to put the dissolved calcium. And so increasing uh, dissolved calcium hydroxide makes the pH continue to rise. So that's that reaction path there. And that is represented by these young carbonate veins that we find all over the place in peridotites in Oman, but also in California, in Oregon, in British Columbia, in Italy, all over the world. As I mentioned, the calcium concentration in those solutions continues to rise as the magnesium concentration falls because the solubility of calcium in aqueous fluids is much higher than the magnesium solubility, or another way of saying that is there's really no alteration mineral rich in calcium that can form. And so that gives rise to these springs that you saw where the calcium hydroxide waters come up to the surface. They have no measurable magnesium or carbon left in them. And they take CO2 directly from air to form calcite to form those travertine deposits that I showed you. So there's really two places where there's CO2 uptake from air in this system. One at the upstream end, where uh, rainwater is reacting with the peridotite and one at the downstream end where these calcium hydroxide waters come back to the surface. Okay, so there's those two uh, places where CO2 uh, is removed from air in the natural system. On this diagram, and notice that many of you will be familiar with various uh, engineered methods for uh, carbon capture involving uh, alkalinity where you use uh, low pH water to dissolve a source of magnesium or calcium, and then you switch the pH to high pH in order to 
to uh, precipitate uh, carbonate minerals, and maybe you redissolve those in a in a loop. But uh, that those kind of pH swing methods cost money. But here we're looking at a pH swing method that arises simply from the natural reaction process. Doesn't cost anything. Okay, and there's these travertine terraces that form as a result of this. And I'll just tell you these little films of calcite on the surface of the rim pools, if you come along and throw a rock in there and you come back a day later, they've grown back. And so for me, as a geologist, that's like supersonic. And that's really when I started studying this process was when I realized how fast it seems to be. So, you know, fast to a geologist is not fast to an engineer. We can use the data that I've showed you so far to estimate rates of carbon dioxide uptake due to weathering of peridotites in Oman today, and they're on the order of uh, 1,000 tons per cubic kilometer of rock per year, or it's pretty easy to remember, about a gram per cubic meter per year. So obviously, if you're going to engineer this, you're going to need to speed it up quite a lot. We're encouraged by the potential for uh, speeding it up by these fits to laboratory data from a DOE lab in Oregon and also from uh, University of Arizona and now also Columbia, where you can see here, we're looking at rate enhancements relative to the rate at 25 degrees C in air. And so there's a temperature axis here, obviously, and you can see that air, four times 10 to the minus four bars of CO2, um, you can achieve an acceleration of the reaction rate in air of about 5,000 or 6,000 fold by heating it up. So this is 185 degrees C is kind of a sweet spot for the olivine carbonation rate. You can also increase the rate of reaction by increasing the partial pressure of CO2 up to about 70, 75, 80 bars where CO2 densities, you know, CO2 becomes supercritical and the densities begin to approach those of water. So that's what this diagram is showing you. They, it's based on these uh, experimental data where this is just a Gaussian fit to these uh, experiments from the Albany, Oregon lab. And since then there's been additional data but we don't really need to modify those fits as long as you don't squint too hard at this diagram and be, you know, don't be mindful of the fact that you can hide a lot of sins in a in a vertical axis that has five orders of magnitude variation in the rate. Similarly, the CO2 dependence, we fit to these uh, DOE data. And, okay, but I, and I haven't showed you the update, but anyway, it's again, that turned out to be quite robust, I'm happy to say. It's weird uh, that the rate has this maximum at 185 degrees C. Um, there's no reason why that should be symmetrical around 185 degrees C that I know of, but the rates are slow at low temperature due to diffu slow diffusion, and the rates are slow at high temperature because you begin to approach the equilibrium where olivine plus carbon dioxide are stable with respect to magnesium carbonate plus quartz. So the chemical potential that's driving the reaction goes to, to zero. Another bonus for us from nature for no reason that I know uh, well, no, I have some ideas, but for no reason I'm going to tell you right now, is that there doesn't seem to be any passivation. So when we look at the uh, laboratory rates for olivine carbonation for sort of 50 micron powders, um, we get over 80% uh, conversion in you know less than four hours. And in those data can be fit with a single rate. So we don't see any sign that there's a reaction rim that's armoring the remaining olivine from continued reaction. So that's pretty special and doesn't happen everywhere, but there's no passivation to worry about, it seems. Okay, so going back to this diagram, um, really what drove me uh, to spend most of my uh, last 20 years or 15 years on this project has been that if you take this rate enhancement um, of about a million at 150 degrees C, and you multiply it by the observed rate of CO2 uptake during weathering in Oman today, you get a billion tons of CO2 per cubic kilometer of rock per year. And so back of the envelope, all of a sudden we're talking about gigatons a year, 
it's 2007, 2008, and this obviously seemed to be worthy of, of attention. Even if you say, well, I don't want to drill to rocks that are at 150 degrees C, that's pretty deep. At uh, 100 degrees C, you have this 10 million tons of CO2 per cubic kilometer of rock, and at 50 degrees C, you still have a uh, hundredfold acceleration relative to the weathering rate on the surface. So there's many ways in which we could imagine using this in engineered systems. And um, I decided not to go through all of them with you today. So we have this kind of flow chart and I'll briefly walk you through the first few steps. And if you wanna hear uh, the rest of it, um, write me an email or invite me back. So the first thing that engineers kind of focused on pretty much before my time was so-called ex situ carbon mineralization. And it involved quarrying reactive rocks, uh, transporting them to the vicinity of a power plant or someplace where you're capturing CO2, grinding them to 10 microns or so, and then taking captured CO2 and reacting them with rock powder in high pressure and temperature reactants, after which you make a big, big pile of carbonate material for storage. And um, so the way that I've described this, you probably won't be surprised to learn that back in 2005, um, the IPCC concluded that um, this is not ready for prime time. Okay, still in the development stage, not ready for implementation. And the most important part of this uh, summary for uh, executives or whatever is that it basically doubles the cost of energy from the power plant um, because of all this stuff transporting and grinding and, and uh, reacting at high pressure and temperature. So um, people are still working on this and there's probably money to be made in various ways, but um, when I saw this, I decided that I wasn't going to, to focus on it. So then we come to uh, storage and most people uh, thinking about carbon mineralization for storage are thinking about various processes that happen on the surface. So this can include reaction of CO2 with mine tailings, um, but it also includes things like uh, sprinkling mine tailings into the ocean sprinkling mine tailings or ground up rocks onto agricultural soil and so on, the whole spectrum of so-called enhanced weathering. And I've put uh, alkali industrial wastes in parentheses here because you don't necessarily have to be using uh, natural rock material for this. So people invoke using existing tailings. From my perspective, um, that's going to limit what you can do because people don't really mine all that much rock per year. And so even for the most prospective rock types, we're talking about right now, uh, if we carbonated every single bit of those rock that was those rocks that were, were mined every year, that would yield about 20 million tons of CO2 storage. So I've kind of, again, left that to other people. Um, but you could mine rocks for the purpose of uh, carbon capture and storage. And um, yeah, I won't talk about that today either, but that does scale to gigatons, provided that you don't mind having big piles of carbonated material lying everywhere around on the surface. What I am instead going to focus on is an alternative where instead of mining and grinding rock materials, um, we bring, instead of bringing the rocks to the CO2, so to speak, we bring the CO2 to the rocks. And I'm gonna to focus today because just to make it so I don't take up the whole time blathering uh, on storage. So I'm gonna focus on in-situ techniques that involve uh, fluids with elevated partial pressure of CO2 circulating through rocks in the subsurface. There's another branch in that diagram that I, don't, I didn't illustrate, but it's very important. So when we're using fluids enriched in CO2, we have to choose whether we're gonna use uh, aqueous fluids saturated in CO2 at some elevated pressure as in the CarbFix project that many of you probably know about uh, where the carbon concentration in that circulating fluid is quite low 
but you don't need a cap rock to keep buoyant CO2 from coming out. Or conversely, you can inject or circulate supercritical CO2, which has a very high carbon concentration. Your compression costs per ton of CO2 are much lower, but you need a cap rock. Okay, so just going back to the IPCC report, um, this diagram is all over the internet and was very influential in, um, for example, um, uh, persuading program managers at the Department of Energy not to give me any grant funding. So uh, the premise here is that uh, for subsurface uh, CO2 storage, you inject that uh, buoyant supercritical CO2 and initially it doesn't return to the surface because there's an impermeable cap rock. Then it forms basically bubbles in aqueous pore space. Finally, it dissolves in a gigantic uh, aquifer. And then this irrelevant tiny process down here in the lower right-hand corner a thousand years from now uh, is mineral trapping. So this persuaded lots of people, lots of very influential people that carbon mineralization was too slow to bother with. I'll just briefly mention the carb fix experiment whose results uh, were very important in this discussion. Um, they're taking CO2 from geothermal fluid and sending it back underground by solution trapping where it reacts with magnesium and calcium rich rocks. Okay, and uh, they have a, an injection well and a production well. And in carb fix phase one, they labeled the injected fluid with carbon-14 and with sulfur hexafluoride. So when the injected fluid came out of the production wells and they knew the ratio of CO2 to carbon-14 and the ratio of CO2 to sulfur hexafluoride in the injection fluid, they could predict in black how much carbon they should see at the production well. And they compared that to how much carbon was actually observed and demonstrated that 95% of the injected CO2 was lost along the reaction path with these uh, magnesium and calcium rich rocks to form solid carbonate minerals. So if we then take that very influential diagram and redraw it uh, based on the CARFIX results, for example, we get a very different picture where mineral trapping is an effective storage method, method on a time scale of, of a couple of years. And, um, in fact, offers a much higher security than uh, storage of supercritical CO2 in pore space. So again, uh, the CarbFix folks are doing fine. They don't need my help. I've kind of stayed out of it, even though that, to some extent, originated at Columbia. Um, and anyway, we see this very active reaction products in peridotites. So I've kind of focused on that over the years. And the notion is very simple. Uh, so drill, frack, drill, and then uh, circulate CO2 rich fluid through that subsurface uh, volume where because of the Earth's natural geotherm, it's hotter down there the reaction rates are nice and fast. Strip all the carbon out of that fluid and return it to the surface. You might even use the thermal energy on the upwelling side to generate some power for the carbon depleted fluid to take some CO2 from air. Okay, and um, keeping in mind that these are geologist estimates, this is not a techno-economic analysis, but I sort of know how much it costs to compress fluids and I certainly know how much it costs to drill uh, geothermal wells. And so this comes out to be 10 or $20 per ton of CO2 for storage, which is kind of comparable to so-called conventional CO2 storage uh, in subsurface pore space. Okay, so uh, one way to take advantage of the natural disequilibrium between CO2 and the rocks is to uh, try and tune the flow rate of the CO2 rich reactant through the subsurface. So these reactions are inherently exothermic because they condense uh, fluid or gas components to form solids and release all that vibrational energy in the fluid or gas as heat. And so uh, there's a possibility to get into a positive feedback where the reaction is fast enough to heat the rocks, but in turn, the reaction rate is positively dependent on temperature, so it goes faster and round and round you go. 
So to investigate that, we did this kind of zero dimensional thermal modeling where the rate of change of temperature here is dependent on the fluid flow rate times the cooling the, we're not gonna heat this fluid. So we're putting a low temperature fluid in the rock. The faster it flows through the rock volume, the more cooling there is. We can try and take account of thermal diffusion away from some reactive rock volume into the surroundings. That turns out to be trivial, but it's in there. And finally, we have a reaction rate in this case, olivine carbonation rate that's dependent on the temperature and the partial pressure of CO2 and the enthalpy of the reaction, how much uh, heat is released per mole of olivine carbonated. And finally, there's this term, the reactive surface area term, which was parameterized as a constant A. Okay, so if in that model, we take, take uh, CO2 at 25 degrees C and we circulate it through the rocks at 10 centimeters per second, or you could look at that as 10 centimeters, 10 cubic meters per, sorry, per uh, square meter of rock per second. If you do that, uh, that's too fast. So here's the rate of change of temperature on the vertical axis, and here's the initial rock volume uh, on the horizontal axis, and you see this peak reaction rate at 185 degrees C and it matters, but all these values are negative. So this system will cool. If we did a time series, the system would cool and the reaction rate would go to zero. Okay, so slow it down. And if we, if we drive fluid through that rock at one centimeter per second or uh, 0.01 cubic meters per square meter per second, then between if the initial rock volume is between 125 and 250 degrees C, then it's predicted to be self-heating. Okay, and actually that sounds cool, but we don't want that either because uh, once the heating gets past 185 degrees C, the reaction rate slows down again. So that's not optimal. And instead we wanna find this place, which turns out to be about four centimeters per second, where the uh, rate of change of temperature is zero at the optimal reaction rate. And those of you who are interested in math, we'll see that this is an unstable steady state in the sense that when you go away from that in either direction, the system will cool. Um, but I like to say these changes of temperature are pretty slow on the order of 10 to the minus 5 degrees C per second. So, you know, I think a monkey with a lever could be could be taught to to regulate this system. OK, so it's self heating. We're all happy. We'll get to the self cracking in a minute. Uh, and we've maybe come up with a method for storing CO2 in the subsurface that uh, creates solid carbonates at a price that's maybe comparable to storing supercritical CO2 in pore space. But there's this problem that the reactive surface area here in this expression was held to be constant. And of course, the reaction process can change the reactive surface area in many different ways. So we often uh, see in textbooks that hydration, oxidation, and carbonation reactions are, have negative feedbacks that lead to self-limiting behavior. They consume the fluid, which is the fast diffusion path. They fill up pore space with reaction products and they armor reactive surfaces so they can cause passivation. So you can imagine lots of situations in which this will come to a screeching halt. But, as many of you probably know, fully hydrated peridotites are very, very common. And in fact, these serpentinites are the California state rock. Every single olivine in these rocks has been hydrated. And we also see places, uh, not as familiar to you, I'm sure, where every single magnesium and calcium atom that were present in mantle peridotite have made friends with the CO2 to form solid carbonate minerals. So here's the microstructure of a rock like that. The light uh, gray stuff is quartz and the dark gray stuff is magnesium carbonate. And so every single bit of this rock that can be carbonated has been carbonated. We also know, as I've showed you already, uh, that these systems last a long time in one place. So they don't run out of reactants and they don't clog up all the permeability on time scales of tens of thousands of years. 
So the trick is to understand this process so that we can engineer it, avoid the negative feedbacks, and maybe even get into a positive feedback system. So again, Bill Fife, way back in the 80s, looking at serpentinization said, okay, I have a reaction where I'm increasing the solid volume or decreasing the total volume. Either way, if you wanna think about it as a closed system, you're consuming fluid, decreasing the total volume. If it's an open system, the pore space might never vary very much, but you're adding mass to the solids and you're decreasing the density of the solids. So those big volume expansions or conversely, big contractions. So Bill said, okay, those strains are so big that in an elastic rock, they could drive fractures that in turn maintain or enhance the permeability that bring more fluid in, cause the reaction rate to continue or even accelerate and around you go. Let's skip this slide, but I'll just tell you that when we look at these reaction products of fully carbonated rocks, um, they don't show any sign of export of magnesium or silicon or iron. So it's pretty close to these uh, stoichiometric reactions where we are adding water and carbon to the rocks, but not taking anything away. And if you then uh, agree with that, it's not really an assumption, we'll call it an observation, then you predict very, very large increases in the solid volume. How are those accommodated in the earth? Well, some of you may be aware of the literature on salt weathering. This is a good example, an experiment on a sandstone that had its bottom in a bath of uh, water saturated in salt, sodium sulfate salt, which climbs up by capillary action into the rock cylinder, precipitates salt in the pore space, which creates, even though the fluid volume is declining, these newly crystallized salt crystals push on the pore walls and break the rock. These are all synchrotron images of this sandstone cylinder that was saturated by, or sorry, um, uh, brecciated by salt weathering. Here's a conceptual model of the same thing, and you can see how this blue rock is gradually consumed by a reaction that increases the solid, solid volume, causes cracking, and provides fluid access deeper and deeper into that rock bottom. Just show you a movie of this. This is a synchrotron movie of a magnesium oxide cylinder, porous magnesium oxide cylinder with water flowing up through it from the bottom to the top, making magnesium hydroxide brucite. You see nothing's happening. But then more or less suddenly, uh, the volume expansion associated with that hydration reaction starts to uh, break the rock, which causes the fluid flux to go up and the reaction very rapidly uh, proceeds to nearly complete uh, conversion where this transparent stuff is the magnesium hydroxide and the orange stuff is the remaining magnesium oxide. We also see nice patterns of fractures formed in the natural carbonate vein networks. So you see all these nice orthogonal uh, fracture sets filled with or partially filled with carbonate minerals. We used to call these ladder cracks. Now we call them Frankenstein cracks for obvious reasons. And we found that we can understand the physics of this process well enough to create numerical models that um, reproduce it. And hopefully soon we'll be able to uh, make sure that we understand this process well enough to engineer it. So meanwhile, here are these fracture networks. We can also ask whether that process is actually occurring in nature. So the salt weathering literature goes back to Corinth and Stein born uh, at, right at the dawn of the Second World War. And they said that the so-called crystallization pressure, the ex excess pressure due to crystallization of, in this case, they're mostly worried about salt in pore space, depends on the concentration of dissolved salt divided by its equilibrium. In salt, that drives uh, crystallization in pore space and, and causes an increase in this crystallization pressure. Well, we're not allowed to use mathematics anymore and propagate that through a more modern formulations for saturation state here, omega, and the Gibbs free energy. 
And we come up with an expression that really can't be quite right, but says the crystallization pressure is equal to the chemical potential divided by the volume change of the reaction. I say it can't be quite right because obviously not all of the chemical potential goes into pressure volume work. There's exothermic heat generation, there's heat diffusion, there's all sorts of other ways that that chemical potential can be dissipated, but we can turn this into an inequality. The maximum crystallization pressure is gonna be related to the chemical potential, which is quite large. <coughs> so for the hydration and carbonation reactions of olivine, we get stresses from that expression on the order of 300 megapascals, or if you prefer three kilobars, which is more than sufficient to break rocks. Now, I was told that you guys like technical details, but I think I'll skip this uh, and just go to the punchline now. So um, this is all about demolition mortar, which i will be glad to talk about if you want to ask. But in any case, uh, we can ask, you know, I told you this can't quite be true. We can ask, obviously, some of the energy goes into entropy and heating and so on. But also, it's not even clear that the Gibbs free energy is the right function to use. Maybe we should think about it in a different way. Suffice it to say, there's plenty of reasons to try and measure this. And so here's an example of an estimate. So here's rocks, uh, these in thin section, these things uh, here were olivine, some of them, the transparent stuff still is olivine. The green stuff is serpentine, so water got in here and hydrated some of the olivine. And then this transparent material out here is Plagioclase feldspar, which didn't react. So what you see is that the olivine serpentinization process, the hydration process, caused big volume increases in the local part of the rock that in turn formed these fracture networks in the surrounding elastically deforming Plagioclase feldspar. And we can say that the strain energy density due to that expansion, so the stress times the strain, uh, or in turn, the uh, strain energy density is related to the uh, Young's modulus on the one hand, that has to be greater than or equal to the uh, surface energy of those newly formed fractures. And we do a little algebra and we come up with an expression that says, that we can calculate a maximum stress for that uh, based on the crack density and the Young's modulus and surface energy. So we don't know any of those things terribly well. Young's modulus might be on the order of, um, you know, uh, 10 to the 11 uh, or 10 gigapascals. Surface energies, no, we maybe know within a factor of two easy to remember around one joule per square meter. Let me plug and chug the fracture spacing five microns and get a value of stress that's quite similar to the thermodynamic estimate for stress of about 2.6 kilobars and more than enough again to break rocks. You can imagine uh, engineering this uh, process. So for example, taking another, uh, uh, lesson from the natural system, you could imagine controlling where that happens by sending carbon dioxide rich low pH fluid down one borehole and calcium hydroxide high pH fluid down another borehole so that lots and lots of carbonate crystallizes in a target horizon where it might drive reaction driven cracking. And so with that, I think I'll conclude and we can talk about all this stuff. Thank you all for listening. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Kellerman. There was so much to um, take in there and it was really interesting and really it's kind of like back, being back at university, which is a good feeling. <laughs> well, um, I am a professor. <laughs> but thank you again, that was really great. Um, we're gonna cut back the prepared questions a bit because we have a few audience questions. And I wanted to ask you, we only have like eight minutes left. Would you have a few minutes after the hour to stay on? Sure, yeah, no, questions? I'm sorry. I, I knew it would go long and- we Okay, no, it's great. But anyway, I, I can stay for quite a while afterwards. Okay, maybe we'll run five or 10 minutes over just to get to a few of the audience questions. Just the two of the two of the questions from the prepared questions. Number one, since we're, so you're, you're sitting here in New York and I'm sitting sitting here in New York and we're working on this uh, carbon removal policy for New York. Um, we've been told 
I mean, there's no current terrestrial geologic sequestration opportunity in New York for CO2, or that's 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 practically in operation. Is there any potential? You know, we've heard about well, last tonight way upstate. Are there any good potential scale terrestrial geologic sequestration opportunities in New York State? Well, that depends what you mean by scale. Um, so first of all, yeah, first of all, well, last tonight is uh, react carbonates a little bit faster than olivine. But I mean, from my perspective, it's not a particularly abundant mineral. And so I haven't really focused on that. But that's not to say that if there were carbon credits to be had, um, that it would be a bad idea. It would be a good idea to pursue uh, elastinite carbonation. And um, you know, I've talked to some folks in New York State who are interested in that. And, and, and I think it's a good idea. If they want, I'd be happy to, uh, to help them. Um, free of charge. But, and the other opportunity that's in New York, the very similar in a, some ways to uh, carb fix, is that we have the um, blood basalts in northern New Jersey and in the Palisades part of uh, southeastern New York state. So they're very amenable to um, subsurface carbon mineralization for storage. And, and the Willastonite is potentially a limited scale, but the flood results, my understanding is that they have- The flood results, if we are allowed to think about New Jersey as well as New York, the flood results are very extensive. Yeah. And so that kind of leads to the second question. Um, you know, and I, I feel like Carb Fix and Climeworks have done this very well in Iceland, but, um, you know, as we kind of transition from a economy built on extraction and fossil carbon that has kind of had negative externalities and been unfairly distributed to- people um, and we build this new economy, we kind of, I think, want to take the opportunity to do it right. So when we think about geologic sequestration of CO2 and some of the pathways that you've described, how would you, how would you talk about the potential effects and potential harms and negative effects of, of a carb fix type pathway or some of these other things that you've been talking about, the cracking on local communities. I think local communities have sort of inherent concerns. There's a lot of issue in the Central Valley of California about the idea of geologic sequestration of CO2. There's a lot of you know popular concern about fracking, which sounds like cracking. Um, can you talk a little bit about the potential, any of the potential harms and how you would potentially think about going to local communities and communicating about them with them about this? Sure. I mean, that's a long and complicated topic. Yeah. Let me just focus on a couple of things. First of all, um, the if you're storing super supercritical CO2 in pore space, you, you do wherever that interacts with water, you do form acid. And so uh, the potential for that to dissolve nasty stuff um, is non-zero. And so it's important to keep an eye on that and make sure that the seal integrity is good enough that you're not sending that acid full of solutes back to the surface. So that's a problem that's common to some kinds of uh, carbonation, mineral carbonation where you're using supercritical CO2 and so-called conventional storage, which of course is anything but conventional. But anyway, um, so that's an issue and um, we'll watch it play out because there's certainly lots of people who are planning to put supercritical CO2 into the subsurface. The earthquake risk is um, much larger for storage of supercritical CO2 in pore space than it is for carbon mineralization. So this reaction-driven cracking process I've talked about is really limited by the frictional strength of local rocks and the size of the earthquakes, if you want to call them that that would um, result from that process or sort of magnitude minus two events, um, billions of times smaller than earthquakes. So not a concern, but, uh, and, and fracking isn't much of a concern either, frankly, but storing large amounts of fluid in the subsurface is a problem because you have a long-term volume expansion in the pore space and that, creates high pore pressures that essentially lubricate existing faults. And so the reason that the oil and gas industry has been causing earthquakes, for example, in Oklahoma, is not really anything to do with fracking, except that they generate these absolutely enormous amounts of wastewater from the fracking process that is toxic, that they then have to put someplace, and they inject that into the deep subsurface, where it demonstrably has caused earthquakes. 
So the carbon mineralization process doesn't involve that kind of long-term storage of huge fluid volumes underground. I would anticipate the earthquake risk is, is negligible. Of course, you know, we can say that, but the proof is in the pudding. One thing that I think I haven't always communicated very well is small pilot experiments tell us a lot at a very low risk. And so people who are concerned about these things should actually welcome small pilot experiments in order to evaluate the risks without putting a whole bunch of people in danger. And then if it turns, if the pilots work out well, great. And if they don't, well, that's a red light and let's go look somewhere else. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind is small scale pilots are our friends, no matter what side of the environmental concern discussion we're on. I think that's a good point. And just one clear on the, the Newark Basin um, flood basalts, would that be a mineralization process for the sequestration? It would be, yeah. I mean, so um, so let's go back. So Cardfix is using uh, CO2 rich aqueous fluids and solution trapping. And so um, they're very reliant on carbon mineralization because if the CO2 doesn't mineralize, they don't get their water back. Got it. If you inject supercritical CO2 into impermeable or high permeability formations beneath the cap rock and basalt, well, I mean, that looks like conventional storage. And then over time, carbon mineralization can increase the security of that reservoir. So you're a little bit less dependent um, on the carbon mineralization rate. Got it. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop the pair of questions now because we have so many audience questions. Um, Dahl, do you wanna hop in and, and start asking a few of those? And everyone, we're right at the hour, but we'll stay another like five minutes or so just to hit a couple. I'll stay audience. for 15 minutes if you want. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kellen. Thank you for your generosity. Um, we have a few questions. Uh, I, first of all, um, there was the audience loved your um, uh, the technical data and detail. Uh, some of that was skipped. And so there is a request for seeing the PowerPoint later. Is that something? Oh, sure. Yeah, for sure. OK, perfect, perfect. I'm not 100% sure that that particular part that I skipped will be comprehensible to you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> put it out there. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. We'll try. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, we also had someone who said, thank you for this amazing talk today, Dr. Kellerman. I wonder how you view the prospects for rapid scale up, given the current activity in this space. Right. So I, I think you've talked to Heirloom. You guys talk directly to Heirloom Carbon Technologies. And um, so I that's one of the reasons why I didn't talk about that today is you probably already know quite a lot about that. They're using looping of calcium oxide from rocks ultimately, but anyway, looping of calcium oxide for um, CO2 removal from air. Mm -hmm. I think that that will, in the short to medium term, that will be a very successful company. And I think they can scale as fast as anybody wants them to. Mm -hmm. um, as long as, but they're, you know, the, the big, the proof is in the pudding because we as a global community have to decide that we want to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. But they, they have unlimited potential. They're not going to run out of feedstock. They're as cheap or cheaper than their competitors. Um, that's a, that's a great company. Um, in the world of carbon mineralization, Again, we don't have trouble coming up with gigantic storage reservoirs. And the pilot experiments remain to be done. And there's some green light, red light situations for some of those techniques, as you maybe saw. So the permeability, long-term permeability evolution for carbon mineralization in peridotite has yet to be determined. Okay. Um, but a lot of basalt formations, like Cardfix, uh, which all the same rules that I outlined today, um, have very high porosities, and it would take a long time to clog them up. Mm -hmm. And so, again, um, you know, without divulging details, there are quite a few very large um, commercial entities that are looking into uh, very large-scale storage in permeable horizons in basaltic lavas, and that can grow very fast. Mm. Excellent. 
Um, so there's, it looks like there's a wide range of possibilities for a rapid scale up. Um, there was a question for choosing ideal sites for sequestering CO2 globally um, and how those sites may, uh, may or may not coincide with the projects that uh, are being built. Cool, well, um, I mean, let me first answer that. Let's, let's be realistic. Um, beyond a certain scale, the political considerations are as important or more important than any geological considerations. But that said, for those of us who sometimes are interested in solution trapping, okay, carb fix style, you're gonna inject uh, water that is undersaturated in CO2 at depth and rely on that rather than a cap rock to keep CO2 underground, that's pretty water intensive. So even done very well, uh, the mass ratio water to CO2 is not gonna be much less than 20. And so if we're talking about a gigaton of CO2 per year, which is sort of the benchmark for me, then we're talking about 20 billion tons of water. Um, and so right away, uh, it doesn't take too long before we are all rushing to the coast, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> Including carb fix themselves in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And so, where are their prospective rock formations on the coast? Well, Oman, mm -hmm. uh, the United Arab Emirates, New Caledonia, those would be the peridotite locations of choice. And for basalts, India, mm -hmm. maybe Saudi Arabia, except that some of those basalts have been around for quite a while, uh, altering and losing their reactivity, but, um, but certainly India. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the North Atlantic where, where CarbFix already is. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Oh, Hawaii. Ah. Mm -hmm. In the US, for it, there's various peridotites, um, but they're mostly inland. So I'd love to do pilot experiments, but ultimately we're gonna hit the water limits pretty hard. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, Hawaii obviously has almost unlimited amounts of water. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it looks like water is definitely a, uh, a limiting factor in um, or potentially- Unless you want to inject supercritical CO2. And there are some real mm -hmm. upsides to that. And I think to a certain extent, other than Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, mm -hmm. okay, who did a, the Wallula experiment was supercritical CO2 and basalt. Mm -hmm. But the rest of us kind of lost sight of that. We were so enamored of carb fix, which is great. Okay, mm -hmm. but we kind of lost sight of some of the upsides of potentially of using supercritical CO2 in some other places. And in particular, I think the enthalpy feedbacks mm -hmm. and possibly the geomechanical feedbacks that I talked about today might be a lot more favorable where the reactions are not supply limited. So when we have water with dilute CO2 in it, the rate at which stuff happens in a given rock volume is pretty much limited by how fast we can get water to flow through the rocks. But if it's mostly CO2, then things might go thousands of times faster. Okay. So another question uh, or series of questions that we had concerned the, uh, the rate of reaction um, of olivine and uh, wollastonite and other um, uh, car minerals that needed to be carbonated. Um, can you speak to the, um, how fast the relative um, carbonation rates are in the various minerals? And yeah, I mean, I, 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 that gets kind of boring to present one graph after another. Um, there's a, a, quite a good, I think, <laughs> summary of kinetics in the National Academy Report on Negative Emissions Technologies 2019, Chapter 6. Um, we are really I uh, did a lot of comparative plots for summarizing experimental reaction That's rates for a whole suite of different rock forming minerals. I've done it before, but um, mm -hmm. I used to be kind of an, these kind of unconventional units. So finally, I reconciled myself with the rest of the world. And so there's lots of plots in moles per square meter per second, which mm -hmm. is kind of the conventional thing. Um, but of course. To apply that, you need to know the surface area of your stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, you know, as you probably know, um, there isn't even a consensus on how to measure the surface area of fine grain rock. So, um, so empirical studies will, will always be important. Okay. 
Uh, and just a, a few last questions. Um, I, I, I we, we were talking about five minutes, but uh, if you happen to be here for 15 minutes. Uh, I'm fine, I'm fine. We have uh, excellent uh, questions from the audience. One of the questions concern how deep do we need to drill in, in, to reach the favorable temperature of 180 degrees Celsius? <laughs> Pretty deep. No, no, you might want to think in terms of easing off a little bit on that requirement. Uh, so first of all, let's let's go back though. So mm -hmm. if, and again, I think this it, it really wasn't apparent to me in 2008, but I think this really requires that you deliver the CO2 as supercritical fluid. But mm -hmm. if you can get into that sweet spot where the um, enthalpy of the reaction is actually maintaining or heating the rock volume, mm -hmm. then uh, you could get to 185 C. Mm -hmm. uh, but Otherwise, you know, I mean, most places on Earth, the temperature increases by 20 to 30 degrees per kilometer. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a tropical place where the mean annual temperature is already 30 degrees C, then to get to 150, you're going to need to go down six kilometers. And, and, you know, the geothermal industry will do that, but mm -hmm. that looks pretty expensive to me. So I might want to settle for, sorry about the police car here. So I might want to settle for 150 or 100 mm -hmm. degrees C. So in Oman, we can get to 100 degrees C in three kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. So that's right now. If if I'm when I'm advising 4401, mm -hmm. uh, which is for those of you who don't know, is a startup doing carbon mineralization in peridotite in Oman. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking boreholes one, two, three kilometers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as far as room temperature conditions and pressure, um, are, w w would you advocate that more research be done under those conditions rather than um, uh, higher temperature, higher pressure conditions? Well, that's interesting. So um, I'm not going to, but uh, so people associated with Greg Dippel, who I mentioned is kind of the mind tailings guru in my view, uh, and his students. Uh, most notably in this context, Anna Harrison, are thinking about um, using gas enriched in CO2 to carbonate mine tailings. So that's effectively what somebody's mm -hmm. asking. So I could take flue gas, for example, and percolate it through mine tailings, and now it's 10% CO2. So in a simple world, that's a tenth of a bar of, mm. of CO2 instead of four times 10 to the minus four bars of CO2. So um, you know, that, that's not a terrible idea, but if you start going too much higher, you run the risk of venting a whole bunch of CO2 back into the air. Yes, yes. And um, there are a few more questions, but I think I will stop there and let uh, Toby wrap things up. Um, it, this has been excellent. I thank you again, Dr. Beth Kellerman. Okay, let me just uh, tell you, if people have questions and they're burning questions and there's not time for them now, um, it's pretty easy to find my email online. It's mm -hmm. peterk at ldeo.columbia.edu. And I'll be glad to uh, respond. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doll. Thank you again, Dr. Kellerman. This was really great. And we really appreciate your generosity and sharing all of this uh, fantastic research and information with us. Um, so thank you again for being with us. Super. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Thank you.